Yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, you know, without without more ado, which I'm always happy for, uh, just a little bit about Capital District Regional Planning Commission. Uh, we are 40 years young. We've been working with communities throughout the four counties in upstate New York, Albany, Saratoga, Schenectady, and Rensselaer, uh, on issues that uh, go beyond municipal borders. So economic development, what are qualities? Certainly, we'll talk about how how um, how that functions into the how that gets into the mix today. Uh, um, juvenile detention, um, uh, criminal justice. Uh, is, is an interesting area that we work in as well. Uh, sustainability, um, land use and transportation connections. Uh, so um, we work with communities throughout the region in addressing those issues that go beyond municipal borders or uh, working in collaborative efforts to get communities to work together on issues. And the Albany Pool Communities Combined Sewer Overflow Long-Term Control Plan, which is such a great title that no one would ever use on a business card, uh, is, uh, is my core central program. And it goes right back to getting communities to work together uh, towards a common goal. And that common goal is making sure that we are um, bringing the Hudson River in this area of the state back into, um, back into compliance with state and federal uh, water quality standards. So with that, I'm gonna to go to my first slide. Um, and I wanna thank folks for joining me. I see a few names uh, for people that have, um, that have attended this presentation before. So I apologize if um, some of this material is, um, is a little bit remedial, uh, but I think it's good to present to you why we are where we are in addition to where we are going and what's happening on the ground today. And there's a lot, there's a lot happening on the ground today, a lot of earth moving uh, and construction going on, particularly within the city of Albany. And uh, I'm really thankful to be able to share um, the progress of that program. So um, I will stop with the uh, ado and just present basically um, a little bit of history about our project and what makes Albany um, unique and not unique in some contexts. So uh, in 1832, uh, this was the Beaver Creek. We're going to talk a little bit about this tributary in particular, but it was uh, at this point in time in the city of Albany, if those of you are familiar, this is the this is the Hudson River. This is an island that was since uh, eliminated with the construction of 787, and this is the Beaver Creek primarily going through the south end of Albany with some branches that extended to today what would be Hackett Boulevard um, and then up into uh, an area that's now Washington Park. Uh, and at this time, it was basically an, you know, an open sewer, um, roof drains and uh, road ditches and um, privies and those sorts of things drained right into it. Um, we, we know today that was that's absolutely disgusting from a public health standpoint. Uh, and it's no surprise that uh, not long after significant development was occurring in the city of Albany, uh, that was um, that was become to be addressed as a, pu a public health concern um, and uh, sanitation was a, was a big concern, a public works project uh, launched in order to um, get it out of sight and out of mind and delivered to the Hudson River where it wouldn't be so offensive uh, to folks that were living near it. This is some time later, um, and the, the creek is starting to become part of the urban landscape. This area in green is Washington Park to give some folks some references to the geography of the landscape in, in, um, in Albany. And this maps from uh, 1866. So what did they do with the Beaver Creek? They basically cut a hole in the ground. Uh, they built a pipe, and then they covered it back up. Uh, and this is Lincoln Park. Uh, this is an area that was known as Buttermilk Falls. Um, and this is uh, roughly 1896. They simply just eliminated the falls and buried the creek underground. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this particular site later on. So keep this image in the front of your brain when we're talking about um, the, the ways that we're trying to uh, address uh, combined sewer overflows and address infrastructure that is uh, significantly old, but also buried way, way deep underground. Um, and we know that this led to a significant amount of problems, these unfettered combined sewer overflows or sending stormwater into the Hudson River, an image that's not unique to Albany. It was a national concern in the 1960s, uh, you know, especially when, when our river started catching on fire. <laughs> it was a concern first with addressing industrial contaminants and pollutants uh, and then starting to address uh, biological concerns um, like combined sewer overflows. Uh, I do have to remind folks, combined sewer flows are permitted discharges. They're not spills. The system is built in this fashion because water treatment plants were built after these 
combined sewer systems that carried both stormwater and uh, municipal waste. So really what combined sewer overflows are, are a safety valve on our systems. One, to prevent stormwater from backing up on streets. And we know that given these uh, prevalence of these hundred year storms that are now are coming every, every two or three years, that we have these issues with water backing up on the streets because the system just gets overtaxed with the amount of stormwater it needs to process. But it also protects the wastewater treatment plants from being inundated. Um, you know, we still get these gully washers um, and, and we do get some hurricanes. You know, we talk about Irene and Lee that do significant damage to our wastewater treatment facilities. Well, CSOs are, are a safety valve that are built into these systems. But nevertheless, they are discharging um, uh, water that is uh, generate, generated from, from our homes, our businesses, our streets, and that does carry pollutants into receiving waters. Uh, when we started our program back in 2008, uh, we knew we needed to study CSOs. We knew we needed to come into compliance with uh, federal and state water quality standards. And we started mapping our system uh, in, in those early stages to be able to understand uh, where our CSOs were, how our systems were functioning, uh, understand the performance and characteristics of these, these systems. If we were going to address a problem, we needed to understand the root cause. Uh, so we did a significant amount of mapping with our um, with our project partners, the Albany Pool Joint Venture Team, which is uh, the partnership of uh, Clough Harbor and Associates, uh, Arcadis, and CDM Smith, three fantastic firms that partnered to be able to develop our long-term control plan and continue to work with us uh, to this day. Uh, so we did a significant amount of mapping, uh, including sewer sheds, where systems were operating, where regulators were, regulators are the structures where the uh, where the um, combined sewer flow is either uh, discharged to the river or goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and we found that some of the, the communities had quite different characteristics. For example, this is the city of Troy. They have CSOs almost at every street. This is the city of Albany, very few. Uh, the difference in geography being when likely when 787 was constructed, these were consolidated by the state. But at one point in time, Albany probably looked a lot like Troy and had combined sewer overflows. Uh, or pipes leading unfettered uh, to the Hudson River at the times. Um, and so what we get here is a very unique uh, way that each of these systems function in each of these municipalities. So why are we doing this? Uh, we certainly had the 1994 EPA uh, CSO control policy, which made recommendations as far as uh, maintaining a system, uh, understanding how it was performing, best management practices, uh, street sweeping, doing inspections, having good internal controls processes, and then the 2000 Clean Water Act Amendment, which prohibited dry weather overflows, which communities were still having dry weather, straight unfettered discharges, um, and minimize impacts to the environment, understand uh, the impacts of those environments and create a program to, to address those, uh, permit phased approaches to addressing CSOs, um, and they also established some water standards. And I won't get too deep in the weeds for this, but our program is mainly looking at uh, the fecal coliform standard and floatables, two issues of concern uh, for the Hudson River that our program is primarily driven, we call it the report card. Uh, we have our pre and post construction uh, stormwater monitoring plan, and that essentially looks at those two, um, those two elements and uh, is the yardstick by which we measure our program. Uh, we were notified by New York State DEC that we were in violation of the, um, of the uh, water quality standards. And I say we because there are six communities in the Capital District which have CSOs on the Hudson River. And that is Albany, Water Valite, Cohoes, Green Island, Troy, and Rensselaer. And those communities are served by county sewer districts, which were created in the 1960s and 70s to manage municipal waste to some degree. So we have two county sewer district treatment plants on the east side or on the west side of the Hudson, uh, and we have one on the east side of the Hudson, and those are managed by those districts. Uh, their job is to uh, transport and treat uh, the combined sewage after it leaves the municipal boundary. The municipal boundary essentially is those regulating chambers. So in that diagram earlier, once it goes over the dam, it is the responsibility of the municipality and they are the permitted CSO uh, entity. They're the, they're the in the violation. 
Uh, but the districts too have a responsibility. They are also permitted entities and it is inherent that the districts and the communities have to work together on any long-term control plan project because um, in the elimination or treatment or abatement of CSOs, there needs to be that partnership because if you're going to send more flow to the plant, you have to make sure the plant has the capacity to treat the flow. Uh, if you're going to make modifications to the regulator structures, you have to make sure that you're not going to overtax the intercepting sewers that are taking that flow directly to the plant. So the participation of the sewer districts is important. And so when we talk about the violation, uh, it's the six communities um, that were uh, that were part and parcel of that violation, and then the two county sewer districts as well. The unique thing here is that traditionally the way DEC does their violations, um, they will work with an individual municipality to create what's called an order on consent. An order on consent is simply you shall fix this problem. Uh, the six communities in two county sewer districts are all on one order on consent. Uh, and it's rather unique. It's not common for that to, to take place where, um, you know, I, I attribute it to as um, everybody's in the car when you're speeding, they're all telling the driver to go faster. And uh, ultimately the driver gets the ticket, right? We, we know we're all responsible for some level of, um, of uh, water quality violation to the Hudson River. We know we needed to address it collectively. And so the communities um, started working on this collaboratively to create a long-term control plan that would respond to the order on consent. And there are some significant violations to, um, uh, there are some significant uh, penalties to violating that order on consent and not meeting um, project deadlines that uh, put into place the long-term control plan. So why are we working together? Uh, certainly we all have CSOs on the Hudson River. We can save money by developing one long-term control plan, one baseline, one set of data. Um, certainly there are benefits to collaborating on grants. So um, if the communities are not competing against each other, it makes it uh, less burdensome for them to point to their neighbor and say, hey, that money should have gone to mine or I had a better facility. Uh, we really can work collaboratively to make sure that that money, if it comes into a program, is maximized. Um, how does it work? We have, um, as uh, the Albany Pool communities who I mentioned, the contributing towns that are outside or satellite to those communities. Uh, we have the regulatory agencies and other interested parties that we're certainly trying to keep in the mix. Uh, and then CDRPC functions as a glue. Uh, the best way I can, I can create an analogy for this is uh, CDRPC convenes the communities, we create reports, um, we try to keep the machine moving along, but we're also the financial conduit for the program. And so in large degree, uh, we are like that person at the restaurant that has to figure out the bill um, <laughs> and uh, the food just keeps coming. So uh, next time you got to eat with, with a bunch of people, hopefully that will be soon and, and you start figuring out the bill and who had what. Um, and uh, that there's always a guy that doesn't wanna pay uh, at the table. Um, just, just have some sympathy for me in this program and how we figure this out. Uh, and I mean that tongue in cheek, actually our program's working very well. It's just the best analogy I can come up with. So let's take a look at our baseline. Uh, when we started the program, we had more than 1.2 billion gallons of untreated CSO volume going out to the Hudson River, as many as 65 events per community. Uh, and uh, we had up to 30 fecal coliform water quality standard violations in a given year. Uh, so we needed, we needed to do some work. We also had about 70% full wide capture when we took into consideration all those communities. Um, and there you can see the volume of over of, of discharges. So we have some big communities, we have some little communities making impacts to the Hudson River. Our biggest two, without surprise, uh, is City of Albany, City of Troy, most densely populated, uh, most area of impervious surface, um, and biggest catchment area for combined sewer flows, most significant networks. So really not a not a significant surprise here, but uh, we can see from, from the number of events, Troy has almost 60, has on average 65 overflow events per year uh, and a very low percent capture. So we knew we now needed a lot of little projects in Troy or we needed to make some significant improvements to the conveyance systems in the city of Troy. Um, through that planning effort, we were able to identify some of the issues, what outfalls were discharging the most. Uh, we talk about Big C, we'll certainly talk about that for the city of Albany. That is the most significant source of uh, CSO volume to the Hudson River. Uh, so we knew we needed to address that. Uh, we knew we needed to upgrade wastewater treatment plant capacity to address additional flow. Um, and we had some flooding. I mean, this is not just a CSO control project. The city of Albany 
is looking at this holistically and doing projects all over the city to address uh, neighborhood flooding and incorporate stormwater management into their programs. So they are focused on addressing quality of life issues as well as the environmental sustainability and public health concerns. Um, and other issues in Troy, they were having dry water overflows. They, lucky them, got an additional water and consent to address those. And they've since done that. They had pump station constraints, and river over inflow, which necessitated a better tide through the program. So we arrived on how are we going to go through this program? We are going to do a, uh, a demonstrative approach. We're not going to limit the CSO discharges, but we're going to make sure that they don't preclude water quality. And that's important when we're talking about communities with as many as 65 overflow events per year. Um, we want to minimize those overflow events and then make sure that those overflow events don't contribute to water quality standard by Britain. Violations. So we're in a prove it. We're not a throw money at a problem and hope that we can contain all this stormwater flow because there's a lot. Uh, we are in, we are going to build what we need to build. And if it doesn't do the trick, we'll negotiate on either building more or recalibrating our efforts and understanding what's happened, what's changed um, and what we need to continue to do. But this is a prove it approach. This isn't a, well, I've got three overflows per year and that's all that, that I'm going to be able to do. Um, so uh, where are we and where do we want to be? Uh, when we started the program, I talked about those program metrics, but in the end, we want to cut our volume in half. Uh, still the same amount of events, but our volume is going to be significantly reduced. We're going to get to 85% capture. That means that 85% of the stormwater is treated. Um, we're going to capture floatables, that garbage that can go out through the uh, through the combined sewer outfalls. Uh, and we're going to have seasonal disinfection at the wastewater treatment plants. And this is a big one, no violations at our... Um, uh, for our uh, for the Hudson River in the Albany Pool region. Uh, what is our program? We have about $10 million uh, of budgeted projects for uh, disinfection, uh, $3 million in wastewater treatment plant improvements, roughly four. Uh, we have optimization projects, regulator up, uh, retrofits and pump stations and those sorts of things. Um, the biggest one, and we'll talk about this, is, is our satellite treatment of floatables control. We'll go into that in great detail. Uh, that was the biggest element of our program in effort to address some of those uh, significant discharges um, at the Beaver Creek uh, CSO, um, and then to be able to collect uh, floatables in different regulators um, uh, throughout the city of Albany. Uh, and, and in Cohoes too, we have one project coming up in Cohoes. So gross cost of the program, 136 million, gross cost of the pool projects uh, to the communities uh, that are sharing the cost, $102 million. It's quite a large price tag when you see uh, when you see 136 million dollars to be shared regionally. We're not used to seeing project costs of, of that magnitude. But I say to people, when you look at similar uh, long-term control plans that are under consent order, yes, there are some differences in the size of population of the catchment area, but there are otherwise similar uh, amounts of overflow volume uh, and comparable numbers um, uh, roughly between them, and you can start to see. Uh, the differences in cost. Now, the Hudson River is well mixed. It's an estuary. Nature's doing a great job of cleaning up after us humans. Uh, so that is a significant advantage uh, that we have that certainly Buffalo Sewer Authority and Onondaga County don't have. Um, their waters are much more, I don't want to say stagnant, but the Hudson River is mixed far better. But also we're sharing in our program costs. And I think we're we're selectively engaged in projects that are going to have the maximum benefit. Uh, even $640 million is probably a price tag that communities like New York City or Portland or Chicago uh, or, or Boston would have liked to have had for their, for their programs, which are even more significantly expensive. Um, we can see here, here's Washington, DC, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, you know, their, their compliance costs are in the billions. So, um, how is this all being funk? How is this all uh, coming together? And I, I promise I'll get to our update soon. Uh, we have um, we have an IMA between the communities that outlines their roles and responsibilities. And I, I, I call this the magic formula. The, this is the calculation by which the communities contribute to paying for an infrastructure improvement, no matter where the facility is located. So if we have a project in Albany, that's the, that's the formula that gets applied. Project in Troy, that's the formula that's applied. On the other side of the coin, if Albany gets a grant, that's the formula that's applied. So you see now we're very competitive in applying for funds. So when we get $5 million from the state, thank you very much for a project like the Beaver Creek Clean River facility. Uh, Troy is, is um, 
is enjoying the, the benefit of that cost reduction. So we're reducing the costs to rate payers in all the communities, not just one. And so it's a true collaborative endeavor, not a competitive endeavor. And we have one Hudson River. We shouldn't be competing for the scant resources. We should be working together to find out how we are going to stretch those dollars to make sure we're in our program metrics. Um, we developed a local uh, 501c3 local development corporation to be the financial conduit. Uh, CDRPC manages that on behalf of the community. We meet monthly to review projects, how they're performing, budgets, uh, making sure that we have transparency in our program. All of our um, uh, meetings are open to the public and our meeting minutes are posted on the website. We also launched a uh, notification system website. So it's a probability-based system that in uses weather, real-time weather data to inform whether there are the likelihood of CSOs are occurring within our communities. It was built to comply with the Sewage Pollution Right to Know Act. Uh, since the time that this website was built uh, and the final, uh, the final rules and regs on that act, um, there's a little bit of a schism between the way the website functions and the way the state has promulgated those rules. So our website is, um, is in addition to, uh, it doesn't take the, the role of the primary tool for outreach, but we still think this is a great visual representation for anyone who may be coming in with the Hudson River as far as uh, whether they can expect the combined sewer overflow to be occurring. We do have a great website. Uh, I think I shared it in the chat. This is a clearinghouse for all of our materials. And I really would encourage folks to check it out. Everything's there from, from our compliance metrics, which is the real dry stuff to our annual reports that we submit to DEC, to our program metrics, post-construction compliance monitoring. Uh, everything that we collect and generate uh, as far as this program is loaded onto this website, uh, including project reports. Uh, it's a great tool. Um, this presentation will probably be archived on that website as well. Um, and it's it's a one-stop shop for, uh, the, the, for the program. And I think it's the easiest way for uh, elected officials, uh, community members, advocacy groups, members of the media to find out how the program is performing. Um, and for, for wonks who want to get into the nuts and bolts of how our program operates, this is also a great way to, uh, to get that data as well. So now I've talked about the foundation and I can talk about, <laughs> I can talk about um, how our pro project is performing. Um, early on, I heard don't make slides in class, you know, when you're talking about um, the, the underpinnings of uh, public presentations, don't make slides with lots of text, right? That's kind of like the gospel. Well, in this case, I like to illustrate the sheer volume of projects we completed and communities have completed them uh, since 2011, anticipating that they were going to get an order on consent. They started early, they didn't wait until they got the orders to start these projects. They said, we're doing impactful projects today that we would like so-called credit for. Um, so a number of different projects took place uh, between uh, 2011 and 2014 when we ultimately signed the order on consent. So communities were ramping up. They were making significant investments uh, in upgrading their, um, their, their systems uh, in order to reduce combined sewer overflows and address uh, the on-street flooding and flooding. And they continue to. This is from 2011, 2014. Our program was front loaded with a lot of significant projects, but small in volume. So we started out with an annual budget between the communities of a few million dollars, anticipating that we would get to the much larger, more difficult to process projects uh, later on in the program. And that's, you know, big C, floatables, controls, uh, sewer separation. So we front loaded with a lot of project volume, um, but we still had to get through, uh, you know, coming up with the, the financial means and um, access to funding through partners like Environmental Facilities Corporation. So they didn't they didn't start hitting those larger dollar value projects until later in the program, kind of spinning up to that process. Um, and the design work for projects like Big C needed some time to be able to uh, to be able to, to, to percolate, if you will, and, and uh, be developed. So, you know, we've got, a, we've got a lot of projects that we've done and a lot of very impactful projects as well. Uh, to date, we've completed uh, 65 projects. We have three projects in design right now, a sewer separation project, two uh, in Troy and two in Cohoes. Um, we are continuing to implement the post-construction compliance mining program, collect data about what's in the Hudson. And then Beaver Creek is under construction. I'll share some photographs from that as well. I talked about completed projects uh, going clockwise. At the top, we have disinfection at, this is at the Albany County's North Treatment Plant. Um, we have uh, a UV disinfection uh, 
process, which is at Albany County South Plant, another UV system that was installed at the Rensselaer County Sewer District Plant uh, on the Rensselaer side. A number of green infrastructure projects. This is Green Island. This is Troy. This is City of Albany. Um, and green infrastructure to kind of extol the benefits certainly has a end of pipe benefit, but these have significant community benefits as well. Uh, this is North Swan Street Park in Albany, once uh, like a basic barren parking lot with, uh, with uh, you know, a basketball hoop or two. Now it's a, a premium park that people can enjoy, and it also has a significant stormwater benefit. Uh, this is uh, Route 32 in Watervliet, a uh, complete uh, reimagining of that corridor, complete with bioretention basins and what's not pictured here, a uh, rain garden um, to be able to manage stormwater, but also provide some significant community benefits. The greatest compliment I heard at this project was, you know, people certainly don't like construction and there was some uh, there was some consternation about construction on the street, elimination of parking during that period it happens. But at the end of the project, there was folks that were upset that the project boundaries weren't increased. Uh, and that's that's a compliment um, because people recognize the value and the community benefits of that particular project. This is uh, Quail Street, my hometown of Albany, uh, a significant amount of investment in that corridor with um, uh, with some porous material and uh, tree pits and some mixed media um, structural soil in order to basically soak up uh, stormwater. And this also addressed a lot of on-street issues that were occurring in this area as well. We had some significant flooding uh, from some uh, some storms that came through Albany. So is this a CSO control project? Yes. Is this a community be uh, beautification project? Yes, that too. And also addresses um, some surface flooding issues, which are really important to the folks that are, that are living in this neighborhood. Um, certainly everybody's going to celebrate water quality, but when your basement's flooding or you have uh, flooding on your street, your primary concern is, is your property and safety. So Albany is engaged in a lot of projects like this that have multiple benefits. Um, this is a, a, a stream outfall. Troy separated a combined sewer overflow uh, pipe from, uh, from an underground stream um, and now has a new discharge point. And then we have new pump stations um, that are being installed at um, the, by the Rensselaer County Sewer District. Uh, not new pump stations, but significant upgrades to be able to send more uh, flow to the plants. So by the numbers, um, the district projects, we had a budget of, of just over $43 million. Uh, the, the districts have invested over uh, $25 million. They're mostly complete with their obligations under the program. Uh, we leveraged more than $8 million in grants um, to, to support those projects and completed costs to the districts to date just north of $17 million. And that to the penny is, is true. Uh, that's what the districts have absorbed in costs and, and share with, with their ratepayers through those capital improvements. Our community's budgets, um, granted, we're still working through these projects. So when we talk about a budget, it's the total cost of the $45 million or $55 million Beaver Creek Clean River project is incorporated there. Um, so obviously, we're, we're counting the full amounts. Uh, and then, uh, the investment to date has nearly been $55 between the six communities. The, the number I'm really proud of is this grants leverage to date. Um, our project partners, our um, the communities, the um, Albany Pool Joint Venture Team. They have been just fantastic. Uh, elected officials in each of the communities have been very aggressive in pursuing grants. And we look at the cost to communities to date for, uh, for projects, and we're just north of $23 million. Our, our largest projects have yet to happen, but that's a significant savings to local rate payers. And a large percentage of the population in our urban areas, uh, you know, uh, uh, water and sewer taxes are completely regressive. And so to be able to, to um, to uh, keep costs low for seniors or low-income individuals or people struggling with poverty, that's a real, that's a real critical issue um, for uh, elected officials in this area. So being able to use those leverage grant dollars from New York State Department of State, Environmental Facilities Corporation, New York State DEC, many other agencies participating in this program, uh, that's, that's a huge benefit um, to, to folks that live in these communities and, and can't afford higher water sewer rates. Um, doesn't include administrative costs. There are some administrative costs for CDRPC or the overall engineering, some costs that are required by authority budget office from the cost of, of working together, like doing audits or having, um, having uh, insurance programs, but uh, very significantly small, smaller in comparison to the capital costs the communities are absorbing, but the cost to construct these projects to date uh, is just north of 23 million. So when we combine the projects, um, this should have another three zeros at the top. <laughs> this should be $160 million. 
the investment to date is nearly $80 million. Uh, grants leverage to date, nearly $40 million. And so uh, we're looking at uh, just over $40 million in investment to date in, uh, in addressing water quality in Hudson River. Whew, so what does that look like? Uh, why don't I pause for a second? Because I see that we have, uh, where's my timer? I see that we're at the 30 minute mark. Um, a little bit behind, but I do see that we have some questions and I don't want to get to the end without having the opportunity to uh, to take a sip of coffee and see if anybody has any questions for me. If not, I'll just keep rolling. <laughs> Emily. It's yeah, thanks, Martin. We did have uh, a couple of questions. One was about the digital map that you showed. Mm -hmm. If it includes areas south of Albany, north or west of Albany, uh, is it just for the Hudson River? Does it include tributaries and streams as well? So our, our mapping efforts were, were solely for the municipalities that were under the that were um, that had the combined sewer systems and our map, our mapping efforts focused on identifying uh, where those systems uh, were, uh, you know, catch basins, manholes, uh, those types of facilities. Um, the, the team and I, I, I pulled this out of the report, the team did do a significant amount of water quality sampling on our tributaries to be able to identify uh, the level of loading um, the tributaries were contributing to the Hudson River, and there were some tributary enhancement projects that were done um, in the project. But the the majority of the issue, uh, or say the contributions to the Hudson River and water quality concerns, are specifically related to the CSOs. Um, not to say that they're not concerned with improving water qualities on the tribs, but they're they're focused on the CSOs as the majority primary detriment to water quality in the Hudson River. Um, but communities have made significant investments in their, their tributaries. Albany daylighted the Patroon Creek. Uh, Troy and um, Rensselaer did some pipelining from uh, pipes underneath the, the, um, uh, their tributaries. Um, and so we did, and then this data is all on our, on our website as far as what's happening in the tributaries, uh, pre and post construction as well. Um, but as far as the satellite communities, communities um, that are outside the borders of these uh, CSO communities, they're not permittees, so they're not subject to the same uh, permit requirements that Albany, Troy, Waterville, Green Island, and so forth are, are subject to. They're, they're not CSO permittees, so um, they have a different, they have a different per permit. Uh, they're all MS4s, but the, the ability to enforce against them for CSOs is just not there pretty easy. Great, thank you. We have a couple mm -hmm. other questions, but I think we'll, we'll hold them for the end, so we okay. can through the um the rest of your talk okay so on uh though everybody wants to know the numbers right okay we understand what we spent that's the community is the big concern what are the numbers uh but to to uh to to the advocates and folks that are out recreating the hudson river the anglers the kayakers the folks running uh alongside the river myself included um you know what are the water quality improvements that that significant investment we've made, what's happening on the ground? Well, we have made an enormous jump in percent capture. A lot of that is due to regulator retrofits to get more flow into the interceptors and then pump station improvements um, in Rensselaer and Troy, which uh, were quite significant in getting more flow to be treated at the wastewater treatment plant. So we've made, we've made a big jump there. Uh, untreated CSO volume, we're almost halfway there as far as, as, uh, as cutting that down. Our most impactful project is under construction now, so we do expect that needle to move quite significantly in the next couple of years. Uh, Pool-wide percent um, uh, floatables capture jumped up quite a bit. Albany made some significant investments, uh, $8 million of investment with, um, with uh, significant uh, grant support from New York State DEC in floatables capture uh, at, at a number of their regulators. So that number jumped quite significantly and that will jump more when Big C comes online and we make updates to City of Cohoes uh, floatables capture facilities. So, um, when we talk about CSO flow receiving floatables capture, you know, it, it jumped a little bit, 10 million, but the big, the big project is yet to take place. And that's, that's Beaver Creek, which is really going to be able to, uh, to get floatables um, addressed. And I'll talk about how that's going to do that. And it's actually a really unique way that City of Albany has structured that project to be able to, to, uh, to address floatables. And then wet weather flow treated, um, we've jumped quite up. Uh, that's uh, partially from our seasonal disinfection, but also from the upgrades that we've made to get more flow uh, to those plants as well. So we're not there yet, but we've made some significant jumps uh, in program metrics. 
again, our program will be that 30, um, we will be water quality violations at the end of the day. That's the most important number that we're looking at. Um, but by our program metrics and eliminating CS, uh, abating CSO volume, getting percent capture up, uh, getting floatables control, uh, uh, increase. I mean, we are we're making significant headway, and we're we're going to achieve our goal. Um, let's talk about Big C. Let's get into talking about Beaver Creek. So, uh, Beaver Creek is our most impactful project. It is a satellite treatment facility. So, it's not a full scale sewage treatment plant as you may think of with a, with um, with screening and uh, grit removal and primary and secondary and disinfection. Um, it is an, a disinfection only facility, and it's really really unique. Um, uh, early on in the process, the, the joint venture team did some analysis as far as what types of uh, CSO controls could be implemented in, um, in the city of Albany uh, to be able to achieve the same benefits that the Beaver Creek Clean River facility uh, has. And so they looked at everything from doing sewer separation uh, to storage facilities, to tunneling, to uh, green infrastructure throughout the city. Um, and then expansion of the, the South Wastewater Treatment Plant. All of these not only have big price tags, they come with some significant construction headaches, especially when you talk about sewer separation on every single street in the city of Albany, the construction nightmare uh, from that would be never ending. Um, but we wanted to come up with a project that was not, um, not significantly going to be disruptive, but also something that was going to be affordable. Remember at the end of the day, we're, the ratepayers in the city of Albany are uh, the primarily the ones paying for this type of project. And we couldn't come forward with a project that was unaf unaffordable. It, ju it just, it, it, it couldn't happen. So to be able to look at this particular project uh, with the sense that we wanted to find that um, a project that was going to be affordable and impactful um, took some real due diligence on behalf of the city of Albany and the, the joint venture team. Um, and, and I got to, I got to, you know, hand it to them for being so creative um, this is the city of Albany, and these are the city sewer districts. Uh, and, and Beaver Creek Sewer District is enormous. It's more than five square miles in size. It's a significant chunk of the city. And you can see here, here's the outfall, right? So to have a facility or some type of improvement within an area like this, you want to address it at, at the choke point or an area where it's going to be most impactful. Locating a facility up here simply doesn't make sense. Um, but we knew that early on that a facility located at or near the Hudson River was going to be the facility that was going to make the most significant beneficial impact. I got to talk a little bit about the historical images when we talk about some of the infrastructure that Big C is, is looking to address. These are construction photos from the construction of those trunk lines that, um, that run through the city of Albany. I talked about um, where uh, Lincoln Park was. Uh, this is Hackett Middle School. That's actually my alma mater. Uh, this is right behind the middle school, the construction of this concrete pipe running behind it. Um, just an enormous cut and cover project to put, the, and you can see the scale of, of these intercepting sewers, just an enormous construction project uh, and, and probably very expensive for its time. Uh, so accessing this infrastructure today is, is uh, no, no small task. Here's what that pipe network looks like uh, today. And you can see the branches of the Beaver Creek extend out into multiple neighborhoods in the city of Albany. So here's the, the Hackett and Whitehall neighborhood. Here's uh, Pine Hills. You get into West Hill, a little bit of Arbor Hill in this area, and they all feed down. This is where Hackett Middle School is, that photo of the, of the, the large pipe right at Delaware Avenue um, and the Thomas O'Brien School of Technology, there's like this, this point where they all come together. So this area here is really highlighted as an opportune area to be able to do the most, uh, the most bang for the buck in, in a, a significant amount of impact um, for a facility. So why is Big C gonna, gonna get us there? Um, well, it addresses the highest priority outfall. It will treat uh, 300 million gallons uh, on an average annual basis. It'll get that percent capture way, way up because it's addressing that priority outfall. Um, and it's going to get us to uh, return time. So certainly there are recognitions um, when we talk about water quality violations, we're talking about a geomine, not just an impact from a single storm, uh, a storm event. Um, and one grab, we're talking about a, uh, you know, a period of time. Um, and so, you know, DEC is very concerned that after a storm rolls through 24 hours later, we're back into uh, water quality standards. So uh, for a project like Big C, we're gonna be able to, to get to that, uh, to get to that um, expectation by DEC that we have a good return time within 24 hours. 
Um, and it's cost competitive, right? That's if, if, if we can't afford the facility, it's almost going to be a non-starter, but we've, we've, um, the, the Albany, the joint venture team, uh, the folks on the ground have really done a great job making sure that they can design a facility which is going to accomplish this at a cost that's, that's quite competitive. Also, that project has those, those community benefits we talked about, like being able to address uh, surface discharges, which, which are a problem in Albany. Um, and it's going to have added storage capacity. Um, it's going to be gravity fed for the most part, not pumping, which addresses operational costs. Um, and we really wanted to minimize construction impacts. We saw those, those cut and cover projects from years ago. Uh, what a nightmare for folks. Um, you know, Albany wants to minimize those impacts to the rate payers. So this is what the project looked like um, before we dug a big hole in the ground. Uh, this is a Delaware Avenue. I mentioned this is where everything comes together. Um, Hackett Middle School is right here. So when you're looking at that big curve in the pipe, I believe that big curve is actually up this way behind the school, um, not under Delaware Avenue, given the landscape around it. There was a there was a slight sinkhole that didn't affect the pipe, but was still a community concern um, that Albany knew they had to address with the project. Uh, this is a ravine um, geographically. Remember that photo? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go back there because it's going to mess up our bandwidth, but that, that, that photo with that kind of yellow brick road and the ravine, that's the ravine that I was talking about here where Buttermilk Falls was located. Well, I think it's roughly 60 feet down. There is this enormous sewer pipe that we saw from the cut and cover that goes through that ravine. And there are two uh, manhole structures that, um, I heard somebody describe them as burp. During a heavy, heavy, heavy rain event, those manhole structures can overflow to a surface discharge. So that's, a, that's an issue. And Albany knew from an environmental justice standpoint, from a community benefit standpoint, that they needed to address that. And the Beaver Creek Clean River facility is going to address that and also be able to make some significant improvements uh, to the park itself. We'll talk a little bit about that. So we also they also identified Lincoln Park as a site because it minimized construction disturbances. But also, um, originally, that part that project was foreseen as being at the Hudson River's edge, which meant uh, potential use of eminent domain, but also would have located that project within the floodplain. Having critical infrastructure in the floodplain is is um, is problematic, especially with a project as expensive, sophisticated, and of critical importance like this one. So, um, the the identification of this particular spot wasn't easy. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But Albany did a great job of being able to uh, work with, with the community to be able to identify a place where you can locate a facility like this and then minimize the impacts to the public. Uh, so the, the proposal is to create a screening and disinfection facility uh, and be able to take some of the pressure off the Beaver Creek trunk sewer line and then be able to send the screenings and the um, uh, disinfectant flow down um, Third Avenue to the regulating structure, and then it'll be able to go to the plant. What I want to do is kind of highlight how the facility operates uh, in, in that mechanism. So on a, on a dry weather day, on a day where it's there's no snow melt or no rain, uh, there will be a diversion structure which sends flow into the plant where it's not being treated. Uh, we have the capacity at the South Plant to treat it, and it goes down this connection down, down Third Avenue. So a dry weather day. Here in the red, you can see the main trunk sewer line. Of Beaver Creek. Now, on a wet weather day, the um, diversion structure will function to be able to still allow flow into the plant, but also be able to use the trunk sewer. Um, and then a significant amount of, uh, of, of disinfection. And I'll say, I know, I know Albany is complete. That's not the right term. Uh, and I apologize. Uh, an early initial screening will take place here, but those screenings will be sent down to the south uh, treatment plant for an additional level of screening. Um, but this will allow the facility to operate without having screenings being pulled out at the facility. And that was a big concern uh, by members of the community that we were going to be screening flow and having dumpsters of, of garbage that needed to be trucked out. Uh, this eliminates that necessity and it's an operational savings as well, uh, eliminating the need for, for trucks to, to take the, the screening out. Um, so this will allow the facility to operate um, you know, largely, I don't want to say largely unmanned during wet weather flow will be manned, um, but it takes some of the operational challenges out of the mix. And then during extreme wet weather conditions, um, there are uh, some bypass that can be utilized in that pipe. But the great thing about this project is 
the diversion structure allows the facility to operate, but also creates some capacity within the Beaver Creek trunk sewer that can alleviate some downstream surface flooding that has happened at places like Arch Street and Albany. So yes, it is a, um, a disinfection facility, but it is also able to absorb uh, and, and, and store, I'll say some of that flow to be able to alleviate downstream stresses. The impact of the project is actually quite small. Uh, uh, two access buildings is required by code in order for people to, to get in and out for two exits uh, and some chemical storage. But the footprint of the actual facility is primarily small on the surface other than a few parking spaces and perhaps some delivery area because the facility is mainly located on the ground. And so the visual and aesthetic impacts to an area of this park are rather small. And so when we talk about this facility and how it was developed, the initial thought and the headline grab would be, you know, Albany proposes sewage treatment plant in public park. That doesn't play well at all. But when we consider the fact that Albany was able to leverage other opportunities in this park and say, we can make the park better, we can minimize the impact of the facility. We can address some of those environmental justice concerns like the burping I talked about. We can eliminate downstream surface flooding. You start to see how nuanced it is that this particular site really does have a number of community in, uh, benefits. And Albany had a series of public meetings early on in this project and used community uh, feedback to slightly redesign the facility to put more underground, to, uh, to put some improvements into the park that really developed a partnership with the surrounding community. And I think that's played out well when you start seeing the press about this facility uh, and how happy people are with the improvements that are gonna be made to the park. And at every turn, Albany has been very creative about leveraging opportunities at this particular site to make improvements in the park. Um, so um, we talked a little bit about that. I wanna, I wanna catch back up on track. Where are we and what's happening when? So uh, the diversion uh, structure is, is under construction now. Um, they're digging a, an enormous access channel, uh, access pipe down to, uh, to construct the diversion uh, structure. Uh, the facility's uh, under construction now, uh, enormous hole in the ground, I'll have pictures of that, uh, working on um, hydraulic uh, 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 construction of pipes underground with an access channel, uh, access bit for those. So no cut and cover, uh, they're, they're moving the pipes underneath the ground without having to uh, make significant disturbances. Uh, and then Third Avenue will be utilized. This particular site is still negotiating with the sewer district as far as um, where this regulating gate is going to take place. Um, that, that regulating gate was required by Environmental Facilities Corporation, uh, some concern about uh, the rate of flow, the CFS coming into the screenings at the plant. One of the big benefits of this particular project is uh, everybody wins, right? The district is going to uh, imp improve the screening capability of that plant, which not only will handle screenings from big C, but anything in the interceptor. So a big win for the district to be able to do additional screening. And again, for the city of Albany, they're able to remove um, the, the screening operation um, from the facility that eliminate the necessity for trucks to come in through the facility. So some significant benefits across the board for city of Albany and for, um, uh, for the, the sewer district who are, who are treating um, the screenings and um, uh, that, are, that are sent to them um, from the wastewater treatment plant. And it does require a careful coordination because the, the, um, the Beaver Creek facility is, is a treatment facility. So it will use, uh, it will use uh, chlorine and then I think it's sodium bisulfate to, um, to do the, to do the uh, to remove the chlorine or neutralize it before it gets to the plant. And there's a careful uh, collaboration there so that they're not shocking the plant. So it's a delicate operation, but they're both working very collaboratively together. Uh, they're collaborating together uh, to be able to manage that. I talked about the park improvements. There are a significant amount of park improvements that are proposed as part of this project to be able to uh, make this a real community development project. And we have a school located right here, Thomas O'Brien Academy of Science and Technology. I can't think of a better place for a science and technology curriculum to be located um, because what a great way to learn about how these systems operate uh, from the, the infrastructure improvements to, uh, you know, talking about biodiversity or stormwater management um, to, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to, 
connect students to um, to these trades and also to talk about we have uh, how are we like City of Albany, other communities on the front lines of environmental stewardship. Um, this is a public health and environmental stewardship project when it comes down to it. Uh, these are some of the preliminary green infrastructure uh, benefits and community improvements that are proposed for the park. So an amphitheater, uh, a learning area, a reflecting garden. I mean, just some, some real great placemaking uh, for this particular park. And this ravine is just basically overgrown right now. Um, you know, it's it's a it's unsightly. It's a problem area, and Albany is looking at reimagining that as a, as a great public space for that neighborhood. Uh, here's one of the access shafts. I believe this is for the diversion diversion structure, um, where they're you know they're they're uh, drilling down. They're going to install the the, the structure, um, and so you know minimal construct. Yes, they construct the site, get on the ground, but minimal disturbances uh, to the surrounding densely populated neighborhood. This is the big hole in the ground that I'm talking about. This is in Lincoln Park. Um, this is at a phase where they've completed their excavation. They've done their slope stabilization, and now they're pouring the concrete floor for the facility and accessing uh, the, the pipe structure itself. Uh, another angle that you can see the equipment pumping concrete in. Massive operation that uh, Keller and a number of their subcontractors have taken on. Um, just a, you know, fantastic to see this work underway in the city of Albany. Uh, just another angle uh, of that particular project. And right here is the school. So, you know, you certainly have um, uh, the necessity to carry on this project with minimal disturbance to the students. So, you know, Albany has been, been working with them to do air quality monitoring um, instead of uh, instead of doing uh, uh, some construction throughout the day. They've, they went to uh, a shorter schedule of blasting to be able to minimize the continual impact of, you know, jackhammering. Um, so, you know, they've been sensitive to the, the community's needs and able to, uh, to monitor the project and make sure that it's as minimal disruption as possible. And if you saw the slides before, the benefits to the school will be a new parking lot and access drive as well. Um, but imagine how excited, like as a kid, I would have been super excited to see this uh, take shape outside of my school. So it's a neat opportunity for these kids to, uh, to learn about, the, about how this, this project is advancing. Um, another neat thing I'll talk about that Albany did is um, certainly when you dig a big hole in the ground, you have a lot, a lot of fill. And what do you do with it? Uh, at the same time that this project is advancing, there's uh, a, a park master planning effort for Lincoln Park. A Lincoln Park is a, is a bowl. Uh, it's a significant, like deep, hard to access in some ways park. Uh, and so Albany had the, the idea uh, to use some of that fill created by the construction project to fill the, the bowl a little bit and be able to make these fields uh, much better. I can tell you, I played softball down here and ground balls are dangerous. <laughs> so uh, having new playing fields down in this area would be uh, a significant benefit to folks that use these uh, for softball, for soccer, and yes, even cricket. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you're taking a project where you're, instead of trucking spoils out of a construction site, you're able to make some improvements to a field. It's just, it's remarkable the way that they're able to navigate this project to minimize community impact and build in improvements. So um, there's my contact information. There's a whole host of other materials associated with this program. I could probably talk for the entire day. Uh, I see that there's a number of questions and comments, so I'm happy to, to address those. Um, but I, I really want to thank Emily and Russell for giving me the opportunity to talk about this because uh, it's it's a really neat, fun project. I'm really excited about the progress the community's made. Um, and they're all they're all in this together. You know, Albany's got this marquee project, but Troy, Green Island, Rensselaer, oh, they're 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 paying for part of this, you know, uh, and, and part of the benefit to them is they don't each have to build a facility like this in their community because we're addressing the most significant outfall. It's, it, it takes guts and leadership by the mayors and uh, of each of those communities um, to be able to jointly administer a long-term control plan of this scope and size. So uh, real kudos to, to them for, for leading us through this process. Great. Thank you, Martin, so much. Mm -hmm. We are right at the end of time. Uh, it's 9.30 and, and we do try to let folks out early, um, but thought we'd take one question if you don't mind staying on a little bit longer. I'll, I'll stay, um, if people wanna stick on, you guys can sign up. I'll stick on and answer any and all questions if need be. I mean, okay, great. And hopefully folks can follow up with you by email as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Um, got Martin's contact information here. So there was a question, um, 
asking if Albany's sewer system overflows after a quarter inch of rain like New York City's system. So different combined sewer systems have different levels of sensitivity. Um, what is that like in the Albany pool for these facilities? It, it, it depends on the location, the intent. There's, there's so many variables, the duration. Uh, we've seen these like little tiny storms that crop up. You know, Albany may get slammed and Troy will be nice and beautiful. So it really depends how, how saturated the ground is. Uh, is, is another factor. If the ground is completely saturated, it may happen. There are there are definitely CSOs uh, throughout the pool communities where a, a small amount of rain uh, is likely to trigger a CSO, um, but it depends on the size of the catchment area. It depends on uh, the weather factors, um, you know, so it, it, it's um, it's possible for, for some of them. Uh, I don't have the on the ground knowledge to know what, where, and the conditions, but it is it is possible. There are there are some sensitive um, there are some sensitive spots. Uh, I will say that. Great. And where does funding come from to pay for these projects? It comes from us <laughs> mostly. Uh, water and sewer rates uh, for the most significant part. But we've also been very very lucky in that. Um, New York State DEC has supported us through the Water Quality Improvement Grant. Uh, New York State EFC has supported us through the IMG grants um, and the um, uh, Wastewater Infrastructure Act that um, that uh, Fahey and um, oh my God John McDonald have have uh, moved through the reg uh, moved through the legislature. Uh, and so you know we can in New York State Department of State is is a huge underpinning. The estuary program was a huge underpinning. Uh, estuary program bought our long term control plan leveraged. I mean, they contributed, I believe it was $2 million towards that long towards our long term control plan. Um, so it's been like there are a lot of chefs that have been in the kitchen helping us, <laughs> helping us make this. So um, the, the state our federal partners have really been supporting the program. Um, the, the money that's not supported and doesn't come in in grants is the rate payers. It's, um, you know, when you pay your water and sewer bill. So uh, every dollar we get from programs like the estuary, like Department of State, like DEC, um, uh, like EFC, EFC is the bank uh, in some degree for the finance, communities financing us. Every dollar is leveraged between these six communities. So we've, we've been shaking a lot of couches. Great. Uh, I think that's a good note to end on. So thank you okay. so much, Martin. Thanks to everyone for being with us today. Um, we'll be back with our breakfast morning lecture series uh, the second Thursday in October, and we hope to see you there. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody.